Martha sat at the bar of the nightclub and involuntarily remembered the theory that a person's life is a series of black and white stripes. Some psychologists often said that life is like a zebra, and if a person is on a black stripe, then they should not despair because a bright future awaits ahead. Others jokingly responded that one should stock up on white paint and fix the situation to their liking. However, these pieces of advice did not comfort Martha, but irritated her, because she did not observe any enlightenment in the series of troubles and did not foresee it in the future. I have a feeling that in my past life I destroyed cute kittens cruelly, complained Martha to her best friend Catherine, who accompanied her tonight. Otherwise, why did such torments fall on my lot? Catherine immediately grabbed Martha's hand and started reassuring her that she should not think in this way. Thoughts are material. You should think about good, positive things. Do you understand? So that the universe hears you. By the way, the universe is very sensitive to words, requests, and thoughts. It always responds to powerful energy charges. You have to watch your thoughts and words. Many things come true. Catherine was obsessed with esotericism, horoscopes, mantras, and affirmations. She even chose boyfriends according to their zodiac sign. Martha was her antipode, and was sure that in this life one must achieve everything by their own efforts. A promotion at work is through hard work and professionalism. A good figure is through training in the gym, not through repeating phrases like, I am successful and beautiful. Now having drunk enough cocktails and being in a very irritated mood, she raised her eyebrows sceptically and snapped her fingers, demanding from the universe, Okay, I want Johnny Depp to bring me a suitcase full of money, then take me to his Hollywood, and let my ex-husband bite his elbows with envy. I want my test results. What a medical joke. Hear me, universe, do it! Then she waited a little and looked at her friend with a feigned disappointment. Maybe the connection is bad here and the universe does not respond. Maybe it should change its mobile plan or something else. Catherine did not comment on her friend's childish behaviour, and she could not be offended by her now, at least not now. You know, I still can't believe it, she admitted with sympathy and worry, looking at her best friend. Maybe the test results were not yours. What do you mean? Martha snorted, and finishing her sweet cocktail in one gulp, asked the bartender to repeat the drink. Well, maybe they mixed them up, her friend guessed. Martha looked eloquently at her and shook her head. She never understood the ease with which her friend approached everything, and sometimes she even envied her. Catherine fluttered through life like a butterfly. Everything was easy for her, and if unpleasant things happened, she managed to find the positives in them. At that moment, Martha mentally looked at her own life and realised with horror that she had nothing to hold on to. Throughout her life, she had been a diligent girl, the pride of her parents and teachers, the one her classmates and neighbourhood kids looked up to. She graduated from high school with honours and went on to study advertising and public relations at the university. After graduating, Martha married Stephen, whom she met during her first year at university. Immediately after the wedding, she found a job in her field of study. Three years after graduating from university, Martha became the chief editor at an image agency. The experience was interesting and varied. Among the agency's clients were large medical centres, auto repair shops and shopping centres. And she mostly wrote texts for corporate newspapers and magazines aimed at elevating the company's image to unprecedented heights. Martha loved her job, but she was paid criminally little. Her boss piled all the work on her, but didn't raise her salary. He constantly convinced Martha that they were critically short on money, although he managed to fly to prestigious resorts several times a year. Martha, with her syndrome of being a meek, straight-A student, swallowed her boss's explanations for a long time before finally realising the truth. A month ago, 
she accidentally saw a vacancy for a PR manager at the prestigious advertising agency and quickly applied for it. The company's clients included well-known brands, stars, and influential people in the country. Trying to get into the company was a bold decision, but Martha decided that those who don't take risks will be sitting in a stuffy office while their boss warms his bones on the Seychelles Islands. A few days after making the decision, she came for an interview. Our boss loves creative people, always gives them a chance, even if they have little experience. But you have tons of it. I'm sure he'll appreciate your candidacy. He's currently away, but he'll reply by email in a month, said Anna, the personnel recruiter, to Martha. But the sad truth is, he's a demon in human form, so be prepared for anything if you get hired. We pay handsomely, but his requirements are high. He has no tolerance for anyone. He hates lateness, delayed projects, excuses. He doesn't like many things. He's a very difficult man. Besides, he's incredibly handsome. But he doesn't look at anyone. Saying this, Anna pouted petulantly. It was clear that she had already tried to get close to the boss, but it didn't work out and it hurt her deeply. To give her credit, she was an incredibly attractive blonde. Her immodest neckline showed off her ample third size, and her plump lips shone with pink gloss. However, the appearance of the future boss didn't interest Martha. She was only interested in the job, and a week later, the mysterious boss approved her candidacy. Martha waved goodbye to her old boss, and fled to her new job. They tried to keep her, even promising her the moon, but Martha no longer believed them. Martha enjoyed working with the new team. They threatened each other with the boss like children with a witch. Giggling and wailing could often be heard by the water cooler or in the ladies' room. Wait until Bradley comes back, then we'll see what you'll do. Although I know you'll be looking for a new job. He won't leave here anyone for their good looks. Martha worked at a new place for almost a month and felt like it was a new, wonderful and happy stage in her life. However, a visit to the doctor dashed her hopes. One day, Martha felt unwell and immediately ran to the nearest private clinic due to her paranoia from losing both of her parents. There, she received a bleak diagnosis. Unfortunately, your diagnosis is rare. The treatment will be complex and difficult. However, I cannot guarantee recovery, the doctor told her. But we will do everything in our power. Trust us. And if I don't treat it? Martha asked, looking only at the trash can in the doctor's office, afraid that hearing such news would make her sick and cause her to spill out all of her breakfast. The doctor was surprised by her question and shook his head. Don't treat it, he repeated in annoyance. Then I give you six months, maybe a year. Six months, Martha repeated thoughtfully. That same evening, she told her husband everything the doctor had said, adding, I learned what awaits me if I go to the clinic. I will simply spend my last days away from my loved ones under some drugs that will keep my soul in my body and prevent me from living peacefully. Tubes will be sticking out of me, and my bald head will always be in a cap. I, I realised that I don't want this, so I've decided not to undergo treatment. After listening to his wife, Stephen was first frightened and then angry. So that means you're not going to get treatment. Are you out of your mind? If there's even one chance, we have to use it. No. Martha shook her head. There's no guarantee of recovery. I want to live the rest of my life in a sane state. Maybe even to the fullest. Maybe we could go on a trip together. I have been dreaming of it, but there was no time. I think now is the time. Do you remember how I wanted to go and see whales? It's unlikely, but at least dolphins... What whales, Martha? Her husband suddenly shouted. What dolphins? 
so that you can die of illness somewhere in the sea or a foreign country? And what am I supposed to do after that? They argued for a long time, but Martha was adamant. She realized that she had not accomplished too much in her life, and since she had an expiration date, she had to use the remaining time to the fullest. Not only did Stephen refuse to support his wife, he also betrayed her. The next day, Martha returned home early from work and found Stephen packing his things. Are we still going on vacation? It's strange that you're only packing for one, Martha said, standing in the doorway of their bedroom. Stephen, who hadn't heard his wife come in, jumped when he saw her. He looked away, cursed, and then looked at her with anger. You know it's your fault. Do you think anyone wants to watch someone die? I've read what's waiting for you. I can't be a caregiver for a sick person. I'm leaving for Alethea's. To Alethea? Martha asked, not feeling anger or offence for some reason, only mild disappointment. You mean that one, who according to you was just a friend and colleague, right? Your lovely secretary? Stephen owned a small company that built private homes. Martha was the only one who supported him from the beginning. Back then, she worked alone to support their young family, while her husband tried to develop the business. Martha worked on advertising and PR for the company at nights. She even found clients, acting as a manager. Alethea appeared as a secretary two years later, when Stephen had already achieved success. Catherine, Martha's friend, never liked Alethea. She usually told Martha, "'That secretary looks at your Stephen too often and laughs too loudly at his unfunny jokes.' She really annoys me. If only she had seen Stephen before he met you. He was a zero, and now he struts around. But you're the one who deserves all the credit. However, Martha, not being a jealous or scandalous person, believed Stephen's assurances that there could be nothing between him and Alethea. As it turned out, her naivety played a cruel joke on her. And how long have you been with her? Martha asked looking at the pile of crumpled clothes that her husband had barely managed to stuff into his suitcase. For some time, muttered her husband through gritted teeth. Martha nodded, then went to the kitchen to make herself some tea. She waited until the front door closed behind her unfaithful spouse, before throwing the still full cup against the wall. She looked at the light brown stain on the wallpaper, turned to the shattered pieces of her favourite mug, and bitterly cried. Martha sat on the floor, hugging her knees. She felt like her life had shattered, just like that cup, into many sharp pieces. Martha lived like this for another week. She took sick leave from work, although she knew what it would mean for her, as she was still on probation. However, she couldn't find the strength to even take a shower, let alone smile at her colleagues or generate creative ideas. Then Catherine visited Martha and, not taking no for an answer, commanded her to get dressed, put on some makeup, and go to the bar. She even picked out a dress for Martha, a short red dress with thin straps. Catherine claimed that loud music, a good amount of alcohol, and the club atmosphere would at least bring Martha to her senses a little bit. And she was right. However, it wasn't the flashing strobe lights or the music from the speakers that shook Martha up, but rather a man. A handsome brunette sat at the bar and ordered whiskey on the rocks from the bartender. He happened to be sitting across from the two friends. Martha briefly glanced at him, involuntarily noticing that the stranger was incredibly handsome. Well-defined cheekbones dark, thick hair, tall, with a trendy haircut. He was dressed in a dark grey jacket, shirt and jeans, which only highlighted the difference between his broad shoulders and narrow waist. Catherine also noticed the young man and immediately leaned closer to her friend. Who let the cover boy in here? 
I'm willing to bet my favourite designer purse, for which I haven't eaten in almost a month to buy, that behind all those layers of clothing is the perfect athletic body. Catherine whispered to her friend in one breath, It looks like the universe heard you, but instead of an old Johnny Depp, Apollo descended from the heavens, dressed in expensive clothes. Martha laughed, but at that moment she was drinking a cocktail through a straw, which caused it to gurgle in the glass. Well, damn! Martha wiped her lips, putting down her glass, still giggling. Strangely enough, it was this awkward episode that caught the stranger's eye. He barely raised his eyebrows, and his lips twitched into a smile when he noticed Martha. Martha quickly turned away, continuing to chat with her friend on unrelated topics. However, the man had caught her attention so much that she couldn't stop thinking about him. After some time, Martha couldn't resist and stole another glance at him. To her surprise, she saw that the stranger was also looking in her direction. Noticing that their eyes had met, he gave the girl a charming smile. Martha, unexpectedly for herself, felt a wave of embarrassment. She was completely flustered under the gaze of his eyes. "'He's looking at you. Listen, you have to go up to him!' exclaimed Catherine excitedly. "'What? Are you crazy?' exclaimed Martha, wide-eyed. "'You're the crazy one if you intend to miss such a chance. The universe heard. Say one more word about the universe, and I'll end our long-standing friendship, and I die alone in proud solitude,' muttered Martha. "'That's right, Martha. You've received the verdict, so what are you waiting for? Have fun! Remind me. Have you done anything wild? Maybe you went skydiving? Danced at a carnival? Hitchhiked to some country?' No, so why not at least flirt with this handsome guy? And if you end up spending the night with him? Catherine exclaimed, waving her hands. Martha was surprised by her friend's suggestion. With a stranger? she exclaimed. Yes, her friend raised her voice. Yes, why not? What's stopping you? Just a reminder, your idiot Stephen left you at the most difficult time in your life. "'That's not a reason to jump on the first person you meet,' Martha muttered, hiding a smile. "'Well, sorry, my dear, but you don't have much time to choose. "'You know, I wouldn't miss my chance. "'If he was staring at me, I would have already left with him. "'So go meet your Johnny Depp,' her friend insisted. "'I'm not going to introduce myself. Are you crazy? "'I've never done that in clubs. "'But you've seen many movies about it.' the friend parried with expertise. And none of them ended in a wedding, you know. Usually these people turn out to be maniacs. You might slip something into my drink now, and tomorrow you'll find my name in the Criminal Chronicle. And I want to live the rest of my life, even if it's short. Martha! The girl tried to interrupt her friend, pulling her by the hand. Stop talking! However, Martha, slightly tipsy, continued her tirade. And besides, staring at strangers is rude, by the way, she murmured, stirring the contents of her glass with a straw, which loosened her tongue and allowed her imagination to run wild, especially if he's incredibly handsome. You know what the problem is? He knows that he is handsome. Such guys are usually terribly self-absorbed but empty. He's probably a narcissist, not an Apollo. I can imagine us making love under a mirrored ceiling for all of five minutes. He'll be trying to admire his reflection and how his muscles in his back and arms ripple. Oh no! Catherine unexpectedly groaned and, struggling with laughter, covered her blushing face with her hands. Martha looked at her friend in surprise, not understanding her reaction. The joke was amusing, but not to the extent that her shoulders shook with laughter. However, suddenly, she heard a pleasant male voice behind her, and her friend's behaviour became obvious. I don't have a mirrored ceiling in my bedroom, but we could move the bed to the closet. Then I would have a better view of my muscles. I prefer my glutes. That's why I squat with a barbell. 
The man answered the accusations thrown at him. Martha was stunned. She couldn't turn around to face him, watching her friend giggling uncontrollably. Meanwhile, the man's tone was clearly amused, as he continued to respond to the accusations directed at him. I swear I'm brought up enough not to stare at people. It's just that there was a bar mirror right behind you. I was looking at myself, like all narcissists like to do. Unable to hold it in, Catherine burst out laughing, while Martha blushed deeply. Stop mocking me, please. You see, I'm so embarrassed, the girl muttered. I really apologize. I'll certainly forgive you if you allow me to treat you to a drink and prove that I am a good guy. To dispel your stereotypes, so to speak. You know, after your accusing speech, it's a matter of honour, replied the brunette. Martha found the strength to look up at the stranger. Up close, he was even more handsome. Wow, it's really late already, Catherine exclaimed, looking at her empty wrist, on which there were no watches. It's time for good girls like me to go to bed, so you can take my place. I don't mind. Her name is Martha. She likes sweet cocktails, and by the way, she's usually not so harmful. It's just a bad day. Catherine jumped off the high bar stool, giving way to the brunette, hung her bag on her shoulder, and tried to leave, waving goodbye. What are you doing? hissed Martha, grabbing her friend's hand and keeping her in place. I am arranging your love life, whispered Catherine and winked at her friend. But I don't even know him. That's the point of getting to know each other, Catherine retorted. Two strangers meet and get to know each other. Better. I hope he gets to know you well enough tonight, she giggled, making Martha blush again. Don't hesitate to text me if something goes wrong, and I'll pick you up. Please, at least try to shake yourself up. Maybe this person will just help you distract, Catherine said, and disappeared into the crowd of dancing people. Martha sighed deeply, watching the blonde with her eyes, but then turned to her new interlocutor. So, Martha, the man smiled softly, I swear I'm not a maniac. You know, any respectable maniac would say the same thing, Martha parried, but feeling very awkward after her embarrassment. Fair enough, the man nodded. At first, Martha felt tense. After all, her husband, whom she had loved all her conscious life, had recently left her. He left her treacherously. So, she did not want to trust men. But whether it was the cocktails or the charming brunette was such a great conversationalist, she quickly relaxed. Soon Martha was laughing heartily at his jokes. It turned out that the young people were on the same wavelength. They easily found common topics, had many similar interests both in the professional sphere and in their personal lives. After an hour and a half, when Martha received an SMS from a friend, she realised that she did not want to leave the club because she enjoyed the company of the stranger so much. She wrote to Catherine that she would stay a little longer. In response, she received many smiley faces in the form of fireworks and a couple more that she was too shy to ask the meaning of. At that moment, a couple more drinks appeared on the bar counter, each with a generous amount of refreshing ice. Cheers to our meeting, said the man, clinking his glass against Martha's. Wait, what's your name? Martha asked, horrified that she had been talking to the man for an hour. She could say she fell in love with him, but she hadn't even bothered to find out his name. Bradley, the man introduced himself with a smile. Oh, my boss has the same name. They say he's terribly nasty. He rarely shows up in the office because... He's constantly travelling, but always finds someone to fire. Can you imagine? I've only worked there for a little time, but I've already heard horror stories, Martha said. You know, I'm also a nasty boss, Bradley smirked. I don't like my subordinates' laziness or dishonesty. I don't like unwillingness to admit mistakes and improve, unwillingness to take responsibility, 
or inappropriate criticism of another's work without alternative ideas. Well, not many people could like that, Martha nodded approvingly. Just then a guy appeared behind her, impatient to place an order with the bartender. He unintentionally pushed her in the back, causing her to fall into Bradley's arms. Whoops! she exclaimed, finding herself in his strong embrace. She felt the brunette's perfume tart with hints of wood. Sorry, the guy apologised. It's okay, the girl said, nodding at him and pulling away from Bradley. However, her hand remained in his palm. She didn't want to take it away, and the man didn't hurry to release her fingers. Instead, Bradley looked into her eyes. His fingers began to stroke the back of Martha's hand with gentle movements. She wanted to ask Bradley something else. For example, what company he led, or at least what perfume he used. Or did Bradley know that his grey eyes resembled morning foggy silver? But all her thoughts flew out of her head instantly. Martha again remembered how boringly she had lived her life. So, the girl took a deep breath, as if about to dive into ice water, and then leaned forward, touching the man's lips with hers. He froze for a moment, not expecting this, but then responded to the kiss. Sparks ran through Martha's body, and lava seemed to flow in her veins instead of blood. Butterflies fluttered in her stomach, which she hadn't felt in a very long time, as if remembering that she was kissing a man in a nightclub in front of everyone. She broke the kiss and whispered, "'Can we leave here?' The man's eyes darkened and his breathing became erratic. The chemical reaction that occurred between them conquered them both. He nodded, unable to answer. Taking Martha's hand, Bradley helped her get off the chair, and they left the club. Martha woke up, rubbing her eyes, but hesitating to open them. Her whole body hurt, and her head was heavy. "'Good morning,' she heard a male voice. Suddenly, she remembered where she was and with whom. Opening her eyes, she saw a man next to her. "'Good morning,' she replied, blushing. Bradley smiled and pulled the girl closer to him. She snuggled up on his chest, feeling a pleasant warmth and closeness. The night had been fantastic. Martha, being a little tipsy, didn't remember everything in detail, but what remained in her memory made her blood boil again. "'Aren't you disappointed?' Bradley suddenly asked. "'Why?' Martha raised her head. "'Well, there are no mirrors here,' the man reminded her, looking mischievously at Martha. She snorted and weakly punched him on the side. "'But you have a panoramic window. Maybe you like it when someone watches over you?' She raised her eyebrows, nodding towards the window. "'Of course, I love it.' Pigeons, seagulls, butterflies, he nodded. I just adore it. Bradley lived in a luxurious area, in a two-story apartment. His bedroom was large but furnished in the Spartan style. A huge bed, wardrobe and bedside tables. That was all the furniture. But the window was exquisite, covering the entire wall. Martha thought it must be remarkable here during the rain although now the sun was shining brightly in the sky. "'What time is it?' she asked. "'I have to go to work.' "'But today is Sunday. Come up with another excuse to run away from me.' The man smiled. "'Oh, no. Of course. I only have to go to work tomorrow,' Martha explained, rolling off the bed and looking for her clothes. "'But I urgently need to finish one of my projects. The boss is coming tomorrow.' You know, that nasty guy I told you about. I don't want to get fired so soon. I really like my job. Besides, I took vacation for a whole week. And he won't like that either. Probably he doesn't like anything except subordinates' tears. Grumbling about her boss, Martha began to gather her things. I don't want to believe that your boss is such an unpleasant person, Bradley remarked, putting his hands behind his back. He watched Martha, getting ready with pleasure. The girl shrugged 
trying to put her hair in order with her hands. I can't draw conclusions until I meet him in person, she reasonably noted, but the rumors about this person do not presuppose too pleasant communication. I'm afraid of him in advance, you know. His name is Bradley Hader. Have you heard of him by any chance? She turned around and saw that Bradley was almost choking on his restrained laughter. I know him, nodded Bradley. He threw off the blanket and smoothly, like a predator, began to approach the girl. She looked at him suspiciously and asked, Do you really know him? Bradley nodded affirmatively again and said, I know him very well, Ma. And now you too. Maybe now you can draw your own conclusions. It took some time for Martha to understand the meaning of Bradley's words. Then she gasped and retreated. No, no, exclaimed the girl, first turning pale, then blushing. Last night you only said yes and yes, Bradley noticed. I liked that more. Martha swallowed and covered her chest, although it was pointless. This is a nightmare, the girl muttered. I slept with my boss. Am I fired? Usually that's how promotions go, not dismissals, Bradley remarked. It was clear that the situation and Martha's reaction amused him. But Martha was in shock. This is not funny. She shook her head worriedly. Tell me you're joking. I can show you my passport. And I didn't hide where I work. I thought you understood. Bradley shrugged. Martha took a deep breath, then exhaled. Yesterday, she was in a state of euphoria, and she didn't attach much importance to the fact that their line of work was so similar. She remembered how much she had told him about her colleagues and boss. Martha backed away towards the exit. Now I really have to go. We can have some breakfast. Then I could call you a taxi. Bradley said, no longer smiling but frowning. Listen, don't take everything so close to heart, okay? I liked you. I thought you liked me too. I'm not as stupid as they say, seriously. I'm just strict and take my work seriously. After all, I founded this company from scratch. It's unpleasant for me that some people treat my life's work so casually. It's a pity if they see it as some kind of aggression. Martha didn't hear his words any more. She nodded strangely, then turned on and hurried down. She found her dress next to the stairs. Martha, wait! The man tried to stop her, but the girl didn't want to wait. She hastily put on her dress, grabbed her shoes, and ran out of the apartment barefoot. She was ashamed, wildly ashamed. She devoted the rest of her weekend to remembering what she had talked about with Bradley. With horror, she realized that she had been too candid. On Monday, Martha came to work with her head down. She didn't finish the project, but she did bring a resignation letter. Why are you so gloomy? Did you see the boss already? Her colleague asked. Has he come already? asked Martha. Yes, the very first one. He's sitting in the office, so angry. I haven't seen him so grim in a long time. Just like you. Martha nervously swallowed, tucking her dark locks behind her ears. She took a deep breath and headed towards Bradley's office. Knocking and hearing, Come in, she walked inside. Bradley was sitting in the boss's chair, surrounded by morning light. Martha slid her gaze over the man, ignoring the butterflies in her stomach. Bradley, Martha muttered, I brought... Well, here it is. She placed her resignation letter on her boss's desk. What's this? He looked at the paper with an unfriendly gaze. My resignation. I can't work here any more. Are you a child, Martha? Bradley said seriously. Should I tear up this piece of paper? Or will you take it down yourself? At such impudence, Martha opened her mouth and looked at her boss. Don't you let me quit? Are there any reasons? He raised his eyebrows. Besides me seeing you naked? Can we stop remembering that already? Martha hissed, unexpectedly forgetting that she was shy. Bradley suddenly smiled and his gaze became warmer. 
With that expression on your face, I like you more. He nodded approvingly, and then took the letter, crumpled it up, and threw it into the paper bin. Martha snorted, but then her shoulders drooped again. Listen, that was a mistake. I can't work with you, and I'm uncertain if I want to spend time working right now, she said. What do you mean? The woman looked into his attentive grey eyes and decided to tell him the whole truth. She understood that after this, he would turn away from her quickly. Although, maybe he would give her a bonus and some sympathy. I don't have that much time left. That's what I mean. Understand, Bradley, it's not like that. I don't jump into bed with strangers. You caught me at a difficult moment. She tried to explain, sitting opposite her boss. I'm sorry I didn't say it right away, but talking about how I only have a few days would ruin the vibe. I just wanted to relax, forget who I am, what's happening to me. Honestly, I was able to do this even for a short time. That's probably why the news that you're my boss knocked me off my feet. Fate seems to be laughing at me, constantly tripping me up. I did something that wasn't like me, and where did it lead? Even the man who I liked so much, whom I opened up to, turned out to be my boss. It's unfair. Bradley listened to her attentively, without interrupting, looking intently, as if he were peering into her soul. When Martha fell silent, he asked quietly, So you really liked me, right? I didn't mean that. Stop. What are you talking about? I told you that I'm dying and going through a divorce, and you only heard that. You're still a narcissist, she said with a hint of irony. Bradley smiled. I've heard that a girl who conquered me at first sight likes me, and then everything got shrouded in fog, he said, making Martha stare at her nails in embarrassment. I don't understand. Are you kidding me? The girl squinted as she looked into the man's face. She vividly remembered how her fiancé, with whom she had lived for so many years, ran away. So why was this completely unknown person to her so calm, as if he were a Chinese statue? Suddenly, Martha thought that this was the answer to her question. She meant nothing to him. For some reason, this thought pricked the girl in the heart with a sharp needle. It was unpleasant. Meanwhile, Bradley who was sitting in front of the brunette, unaware of her thoughts, hurried to explain himself to her. Martha, I will need time to digest all the information you just spilled on me, the boss honestly admitted. However, I want to say again that none of your words convinced me to sign the resignation letter or forget that I had a good time with you. And also, didn't you say that you wanted to try something new for yourself? Step out of your comfort zone? How about having an affair with your boss? Bradley playfully winked at her. Martha smiled shyly. Shaking her head, she slowly, as if reluctantly, looked away from the handsome man's face. She scanned the room where she had been for the first time. Several interesting and bright vintage posters with retro advertising hung on one of the walls made of grey brick. In another corner, there was a shelf with a record player for vinyl records. The girl remembered that Bradley liked retro, loved history, and loved to travel. She thought she would like to get to know him better, and she still couldn't shake off the feeling that she'd known him for many years. There are such meetings, like with old and close friends, kindred spirits, who touch your heart at first glance and words. Bradley turned out to be one of those people, these thoughts simultaneously calmed and saddened the girl. She did not want to think about the future, tie her life to new relationships and feelings because she already knew that a happy ending wouldn't be in her story. I wouldn't want to start a relationship. Then, in the nightclub, I thought that I would run away from you in the morning, like Cinderella from The Prince, she confessed, that it would be my daring adventure, a flash of passion with a stranger, like in the movies, and maybe revenge on my ex-husband, probably. It's nice to hear that I've become an instrument of revenge, 
Bradley grumbled, but his eyes sparkled with mischief. But then I suggest we be friends. The girl nodded hesitantly. Well, it's decided. Bradley clapped his hands. From now on, we are best friends. Oh, just don't say that to my friend Catherine, Martha laughed. She was in the club yesterday. She'd scratch your eyes out because she won't give up her status as my best friend to anyone. Bradley smiled softly at Martha, looking into her, and she realized that becoming friends with this man would be quite a challenge. Then I start working? she asked uncertainly. Bradley nodded, then added in a bossy tone, I'm waiting for a project for a clothing brand from you, and please keep in mind we have lunch at my favorite cafe at 13 o'clock. I'll pick you up, don't you mind? Martha giggled, feeling like a young girl and shook her head. How can I say no to my scary boss? She playfully asked, getting up from her seat. I'll take away your bonus for saying no, he lazily threatened, returning to the papers he was working on before her arrival. Martha smiled widely and left the office. She leaned her back against the wooden door and closed her eyes, still smiling. Her heart was warm, and she felt a strange anticipation, like when she was a child on the eve of holidays. When a child falls asleep in nervous but pleasant excitement, waiting for magic and gifts under the tree from Santa Claus. Martha hadn't felt this pleasant feeling in a very long time. It disappeared from her life long before the doctors diagnosed her. She simply got bogged down in routine, like travellers get stuck in quicksand. Her relationship with Stephen had long lost its spark. He didn't try to please his wife. There were no surprises, no romance. It all seemed to have stayed in their early university years, and now was buried under the everyday life. That's why Martha's blood started to boil again. In her chest, it felt like flowers were blooming, the first spring ones breaking through the frozen ground. It seemed to her that everything would be all right, at least for now. When the door closed behind Martha, Bradley's smile slowly faded from his face. He put the documents aside, put his elbows on the table, and buried his face in his hands, wiping away the accumulated fatigue. The insomnia of the last few days had taken its toll, and now there was Martha. He didn't remind the girl of what happened between them last night. No, not about bed scenes or hot whispers. Those moments were fresh in her memory. However, he realized that she had forgotten a lot. The thing is, before she fell asleep, Martha suddenly sobbed in his arms, small, fragile and naked, and shared her secret with him. The confession was almost the same as her story today in his office, but much more disjointed, emotional, and touching. That night she talked about how her husband treated her, what sentence the doctors gave her, and that she didn't want to live on pills, but wanted to breathe to the fullest until the last minute. He wiped away her tears when she confessed that she had never been to the countries she dreamed of. She said that she had dreamed of a cruise tour her whole life, wanted to see whales, dolphins, or anyone in their natural habitat. That night, Bradley didn't fall asleep. He looked at Martha's face, illuminated by the moonlight, touched her soft hair scattered on his pillow, and thought. He thought about many things, and came to the conclusion that he didn't want to let her go. Although his decision was extremely difficult for him, he lost his fiance, who never became his wife, in a tragedy three years ago. However, he could not throw her out of his heart until now, so he was distracted by work, with such zeal and eagerness, that he earned a reputation as an evil boss among his employees. He avoided relationships with other women, and only had minor and short-lived intrigues in his life. That is until he met Martha, a girl so cute, sincere, insanely beautiful, and whose heart that had been broken so rudely. Bradley's agency was well known for its charity work, and he had always had a certain thirst to help people, which only grew stronger after the loss of his fiancée. 
that his desire to help Martha was deeper than philanthropy. Martha seemed to have settled in his heart back in the nightclub. With her delicate fingers, she touched the strings of his soul that had long been silent, playing a melody and giving his heart a special rhythm. Bradley wanted to be close to her, feeling as if it were the right thing in the world, as if he had been waiting for this meeting with Martha. Bradley looked out the window at the grey sky with rare clouds. One of them looked like a hare with long ears, and the rest looked like sweet cotton candy. He drummed his fingers on the table, trying to calm down the excitement that had not left him in the whole day. He realised that he couldn't help Martha, but he wanted to try to make her last days beautiful, the way she dreamed. Bradley took his smartphone, and finding the necessary number in his notebook, pressed the call button. Hello, he began softly. I'm interested in cruise liners, and also, where in the world can we see whales? The sky was grey and so low that it seemed it would fall into the water surrounding the cruise liner. Martha thought it reminded her of Bradley's eyes, the man who suddenly burst into her life at the most difficult time and then simply turned her world upside down. He became the artist who had many colours to paint her white, calm life. After that frank conversation, they really became friends, talked a lot, often walked, went to the movies and restaurants. Bradley often invited her home and cooked dinner himself. They talked about work and life, shared dreams and interests. Every morning, Martha eagerly waited just to see him, just to talk to him. She unexpectedly realised that every night, falling asleep, she thought about Bradley, and waking up, she also thought about him. After a month, Bradley brought Marina tickets for a cruise. Of course, she thought it was crazy to just take off in an unknown direction, to leave life and work behind. However, Catherine was very insistent. It would be crazy not to do this. I'll break off our friendship if you refuse. She assured her friend. You'll regret your whole life that you didn't dare. And besides, look how Bradley looks at you. We decided to stay friends. Martha weakly and hesitantly waved off. Catherine snorted, rolling her beautiful eyes to the ceiling. Oh, don't mess with me. There's always such tension between friends that it's scary to light a match. God forbid, everything will explode. You're in love with each other, silly, she declared. But I can't do that to him, Martha reminded Catherine. He told me he had lost his fiance. Do you want to lose another person? Catherine's smile faded, but she quickly composed herself. Maybe she shouldn't decide for him what to do. Just open up to him, or at least meet him halfway. Then Catherine took the tickets for the cruise and waved them in Martha's face. Start with this, okay? Martha, who had dreamed of travelling with Bradley herself, quickly gave in. One day, the awaited miracle happened. Whales! someone shouted from those who were walking on the deck at that moment. There are whales, and there are so many of them! Passengers poured out onto the deck, staring wide-eyed at the vast waters. The water was filled with whales, up to the horizon. As the ship approached, the characteristic sounds of the whales expelled fountains of steam and water, surrounded the people from all sides. They were loud, unrelenting and awe-inspiring. People tried to capture this wonderful moment on their cameras. Martha didn't try to reach for her phone in her pocket. She froze like a statue. It seemed that the girl even stopped breathing, and there was no question of blinking. Her heart was beating so fast that she had to press her hands to her chest. She was afraid that it would simply jump out, breaking her ribcage. A feeling of admiration made her lungs burst. Whales in the wild filled her with awe and delight. Bradley looked at the stunned Martha. The smile froze on his face. The corners of his lips trembled and slowly lowered. He noticed that Martha was crying. The girl realised this not immediately. Her vision simply became blurred. The picture became blurred. 
She blinked, trying to get rid of the unwanted tears, so as not to miss a moment of this moment. "'Hey, are you okay?' he asked worriedly. "'Yes!' Martha nodded, wiping away her tears with her fingers. "'I'm just too happy. I can't contain my emotions. There are so many of them inside me that I don't even understand what I'm feeling. My head is spinning with delight.' Bradley put his hands on the rail and stood behind Martha, embracing her tenderly. She leaned her head on his shoulder, still gazing into the distance, and Bradley thought how pleasant it was to embrace this girl, as if she were his other half, a girl created for him. "'Thank you,' the girl whispered, her voice trembling. "'You know, I love you.' Something broke inside Bradley. She had not spoken these words before, nor had he. However, even the sight of a multitude of whales did not cause in Bradley the same trembling as Martha's words. "'I hope you're not saying this just because of your emotions,' the man said unexpectedly seriously. "'Because I love you too, Martha.' At night they were lying in their cabin. Bradley was already breathing evenly, falling asleep. Martha, however, couldn't close her eyes. "'Bradley, are you asleep?' she asked quietly, not expecting an answer. However, the man responded. "'It all depends on you, princess,' he mumbled sleepily, touching her hair with his lips. "'Your word, and I'll be awake and cheerful. Just give me five minutes and a cup of coffee.' Martha smiled. Bradley really treated her like a princess, protected her, tried to fulfil her wishes. "'I thought,' she bit her lip, not daring to voice her thought, "'I thought that when we get back, I'll go to the doctor again. "'You know, it's strange, but I feel so good. "'Every day brings me happiness. "'I just don't believe in my illness. "'And if it really is killing me, "'then I just haven't seen enough of this world yet, "'and I want to live,' she gasped trying to cope with the enormous lump stuck in her throat. However, Bradley heard her and understood. The man's arms tightened around his beloved, pulling her closer. "'I didn't want you to bring up this topic, Martha, because it should be your choice,' he began cautiously. "'But I've been thinking about it more and more. Let's try it. And you're not alone. I'll be there, no matter what happens.' Martha's heart was relieved. She believed Bradley, and next to him, she could allow herself the daring, bold thought that everything would be okay. However, she didn't even imagine what awaited her. The black car stopped in the parking lot next to the clinic. Martha looked at the beautiful building, the windows of which reflected the sunlight. Last time she went to a different clinic, which didn't look as luxurious but Bradley insisted on the best doctor in the city. "'Well, I'm off,' the girl said cheerfully, and leaned forward to kiss him goodbye. Bradley accepted the kiss, but looked at her in surprise. "'Alone? No, I'll go with you,' the man's voice sounded almost indignant. Bradley's whole appearance spoke that he was displeased at Martha's assumption that he would let her face her fate alone. "'But they won't let you into the office anyway,' she shrugged. "'And you have things to do today. "'You'd think that there was something more important than your health, Martha. "'Let's go. "'If they don't let me in, I'll wait for you in the hall. "'Then we'll go have lunch or take a walk, okay?' "'Bradley unbuckled his seatbelt and got out of the car. "'Martha froze in her seat. "'She still couldn't get used to such care, "'such sensitivity that this wonderful man gave her. Involuntarily, she compared Bradley and Stephen again, but remembered when she went to the clinic that fateful time, Stephen didn't even call her after seeing the doctor, although he knew that she had bad heredity and her poor health worried her. She remembered how she left the clinic and wandered alone in the city, and the rain drizzled from the sky. She remembered feeling empty, but couldn't find the strength to call anyone. Her phone remained silent until Catherine finished work and called her friend to find out how she went to the doctor. And Stephen didn't even call her after their breakup, 
just to find out if she was still alive. Martha only came to her senses when the window was knocked on, and then the car door opened. Bradley gallantly offered her his hand, smiling. "'Please, lady,' she smiled back at him, and when she placed her small palm in his hand, she felt a wave of relief. The fear of visiting the doctor began to leave her, because she wasn't worried about anything with Bradley by her side. She was ready for any news. However, what the young people heard after the examination by the doctor plunged them into a state of shock. The man performed an ultrasound, looked at the results of the tests and research that the girl had previously taken. Then he looked at Martha with a strange expression on his face. "'Excuse me, who told you it was time to look for a place in the cemetery?' the doctor asked. "'Can I know the name of the hero?' Martha was confused by the question and the form in which it was asked. Yes, she had heard of medical humour, and a couple of times was even shocked by the jokes of surgeons and pathologists, but here she experienced an unpleasant feeling. Bradley didn't like the question either. He was sitting in the adjacent chair and leaned forward, intending to ask the doctor to choose his words carefully. However, Martha squeezed his fingers in time and blurted out, "'Hmm, Dr. Martinson, I think something like that. The clinic is called Be Healthy. Why, what's the matter?' The doctor chuckled and shook his head, waving the papers. "'Everything is much clearer now,' he said, not hiding his amusement. Without explaining, he typed something on the laptop keyboard, then turned the screen towards Martha and Bradley. "'Take a look at your doctor,' he suggested, showing them an article from the local news portal. "'Henry Martinson, a scam artist. The detainee is already serving his sentence.' He took bribes, spun people around for useless treatment, frightening them with terrible fatal diagnoses. It's strange that this news passed you by. They showed it on all channels, talked about this fake doctor from every iron. But we weren't in town. We had a trip to watch Wales, the girl muttered, confused. Her eyes scanned the article for details about the case. The photo did indeed show the same doctor, that Martha had been seeing. Wait, Bradley interjected with a tense voice. What does all this mean for us? Did he lie to Martha? Am I understanding correctly that she's healthy? Only at that moment did Martha realise where the doctor was leading them. She couldn't even think about such an outcome and didn't allow anything similar to enter her head. Now she froze, her face flushing, her pulse pounding in her temples. The doctor nodded with satisfaction. I won't even offer you any additional testing, Martha. You're perfectly healthy. Everything that the previous doctor told you was a lie. He only hoped that you would become one of his victims, that he would squeeze as much money out of you as possible. He acted according to an established scheme, working in collusion with other doctors who also received punishment. They did all the procedures in their clinic and then said, that with great difficulty and God's help, they brought a person back from the other side. That's why his reputation was initially high. Fortunately, this story is over. It's good that you didn't agree to be treated by him. Martha looked away from the doctor's face, stared at the laptop, then at the table, but didn't see anything else in front of her. Her emotions were mixed up in her chest, pushing each other aside. Shock, amazement, joy, and fear that it was another mistake. Bradley lifted her hand and kissed the tips of her fingers, which brought her to her senses a little, and she finally realised that all of this was reality. I love you, Bradley said, instead of all the other words of joy, regardless of the doctor's presence. And I love you, Martha echoed, feeling tears welling up on her face once again. Looking into the face of her beloved, Martha inadvertently thought that her little failed death was worth it to meet her true love. Bradley proposed to Martha almost immediately after they found out the happy news, and at that moment the girl realised that she was still not divorced. Yes, she referred to Stephen as her ex-husband, 
and she hadn't seen him in a year. However, they were still officially together. Therefore, the girl quickly filed the necessary divorce papers. Later, Catherine joked that Martha had summoned her husband like witches summon demons at seances. At first, Stephen appeared at the door of her apartment, but not finding the owner there, he went to the office. He was amazed to see Martha. She hadn't died, as he had thought. On the contrary, she had blossomed. Love and a wonderful vacation helped her become even more beautiful than she was before. Her eyes shone, her cheeks had a natural blush that was much prettier than any makeup. Martha, Stephen muttered, looking around in surprise. I received the divorce papers and came to talk. You didn't have to bother, actually. Martha shook her head, not at all embarrassed by their meeting, as nothing stirred in her soul. Now we can do everything online. Stephen hesitated, shifting his weight from one leg to the other. He looked around the office where Martha worked, then, once again with greed, stared at the girl. This letter was a surprise to me, he admitted. Really? Martha raised her eyebrows. It was a surprise to me that we didn't get divorced earlier. Now we'll have to wait until everything is legalized. It's strange that you didn't think about it, since you have new relationships and all that. How did Alethea tolerate that you have the wife? Or does she only like married men? Martha leaned back in her chair and began playing with the pen looking at Stephen. He looked pathetic at that moment. However, perhaps he had always been like that. Martha just didn't realise the flaws in people close to her. She didn't even notice his mistress. Stephen frowned and then confessed, Not everything is going well with Alethea. I have problems with my business. That's why I came. How will we divide the property? I was hoping to mortgage the apartment, and... Martha felt nauseous when she realised the hidden meaning behind his words. Wait, Stephen. She stopped him, holding up her hands as if signalling to stop. Do you mean you were waiting for me to leave this world and leave my apartment to you? Stephen sulked at first, hunched his head, then remembered that he was still a man and straightened up. Don't you find this train of thought logical, Martha? Tell me about your plans, the girl unexpectedly asked, leaning forward and resting her chin on her crossed fingers. I'm truly interested. Are you planning to sell the apartment and invest the money in business? Or are you going to live in it with your secretary, who was, according to you, just a friend? This is not funny, Stephen flared up, raising his voice. You don't even know what I'm going through right now. I invested in the wrong thing, you understand? I listened to that idiot Alethea and hoped for a profit. Now I have a lot of debt and major tax problems. And Alethea, she ran away with a man as soon as the tax office knocked on my door, saying that my mess is not her business. Do you even understand how hard it is for me? Martha remained expressionless, while her ex-husband shouted accusations and exclamations at her. She was surprised by her own reaction. It turned out that Bradley had taken up all the space in her heart and soul, leaving no feelings for Stephen, not even sympathy. Catherine would probably say that karma had caught up with him. Martha sighed and returned to her previous position. Okay. In any case, please don't delay signing the divorce papers. This has already been dragged out too much. You'll get half of the acquired property. By the way, as far as I remember, the business created during the marriage is also divided equally. However, I don't want your debts, so you can keep your company. Consider it a gesture of goodwill, she said in a business-like tone, as if making a deal with a client. But the apartment was inherited from my parents. It's not jointly acquired property, so don't count on it. Okay, figure out how to deal with your problems on your own. I've been dragging you for too long. Stephen shook his head and leaned forward. Are you serious, Martha? Why do you need the apartment? You don't have anyone else but me. We've been through so much together. Well, 
if you like. He nervously scanned her face. Do you want me to come back to you? I'll take care of you until... until you die. You know, I realized how much I loved you when I was with Alethea. I made a mistake. This time, the feeling of nausea in Martha's throat became even more distinct. She narrowed her eyes, and her gaze grew severe. Unfortunately, I have bad news for you, Stephen, she said sharply. I'm going to live. I don't know for how long. Maybe a year. Maybe ten years. Or maybe I'll live to a hundred. What? What? Stephen stammered. But you said... Martha shrugged her shoulders, irritated, her brow furrowed. The doctor was a fraud. The story is long and I don't want to retell it. But wait, then we can fix everything, right? Stephen suddenly perked up. You and me, together, like old times. You always found a way to solve any problem, Martha. I really appreciated that. It will be problematic, Martha shook her head. My fiancé will be against it. Who? Stephen asked, staggering, as if someone had spit in his face. Martha turned the photo frame towards him. It was a picture of Bradley and Martha standing on the deck of a cruise ship. The ocean was burning silver in the distance, and whales were visible. That's why I'm asking you to hurry up, Martha calmly explained. We want to get married. To be honest, I completely forgot that I'm still married. I only remembered when Bradley proposed to me. Wait, you're joking, right? Stephen shook his head. You're teasing me. And where was that photo taken? And where was this photo taken? And did you find this Bradley somewhere? Wasn't that the name of your new boss? Martha smiled widely, nodding. It's nice to see you remember something about me. Yes, it's him. I met him not at work, but that's another long story not for your ears. Stephen's face turned red, becoming the colour of a ripe tomato. You had an affair with your boss, he exclaimed, jumping to his feet. Martha unexpectedly burst out laughing. This, coming from the man who left his wife for his secretary, she asked as if she couldn't believe Stephen had brought up such a topic. You deceived me! Stephen shouted even louder. You said you were sick, that you had only half a year ahead of you. I didn't do it on purpose, Stephen. Martha waved her hands apologetically. Stephen shook with the news. He looked at the photo of the happy couple in bright life jackets. Martha was too beautiful at that moment, and she emitted some kind of power, self-confidence, which he had not noticed before. All of this made him terribly angry and annoyed. Meanwhile, Martha continued calmly, looking at her watch. You came to me at work, wasting time with useless conversations. We're getting divorced anyway. If you want a scandal, let's have one. I'm just not sure if you can handle another lawsuit, especially since you're already being followed by the tax authorities. As for the apartment you dreamed of, I don't live there any more and have no intention of doing so. However, you won't get it, Stephen. I'm not a charity fund for cheating husbands. Stephen gritted his teeth with anger and leaned forward, resting his palms on the table. I see you grew your teeth in a year, became a bully like your arrogant girlfriend. Martha waited a second, then she too stood up from her seat and arrogantly looked at the man she loved, as if in a previous life. I've always had sharp teeth. I just didn't use them to sink into the throats of loved ones, unlike you. You didn't appreciate my loyalty, turned away from me at a hard time. You ran away, jumping into the first available bed. So you just can't come back into my life now, and make any claims. You're pathetic and disgusting. Get out! Stephen jerked as if Martha had slapped him hard. His face was on fire, and his head 
felt like it was about to explode like a ripe watermelon. Without saying another word, Stephen turned and walked away. At that moment, the door opened and Bradley appeared on the threshold. He looked at his fiancé's guest with a surprised look, but quickly recognized his face, even though it was contorted with anger. Stephen, right? the man asked, trying to hide the disdain he felt towards this person. I won't shake your hand. Did you come to sign divorce papers? Stephen glanced at Bradley with a fleeting, angry look. The groom himself? Well, congratulations. I wish you both happiness. Just tell me, what's it like to pick up someone else's woman, so to speak, to eat someone's leftovers? He asked with a venomous tone. I have no idea, Bradley replied calmly. I've never had affairs with other men's women. When Martha and I met, she was single. They say some scoundrel dumped her when he found out she was sick. There are such moral freaks, right? Bradley winked at the pale Stephen, but a moment later, his feigned cheerfulness and calmness disappeared from his face. And now, I advise you to leave the room before my patience runs out. Believe me, I'm trying very hard not to throw you out. Stephen felt through his skin that the man was not joking. He silently retreated and left the room sideways. Martha approached Bradley, hugging him around the waist. Sorry for this. I didn't know he would come here, she said shyly. What an unpleasant guy. And how did you live with him? I am itching to hit him, Bradley said discontentedly. Maybe I should catch up with him. Don't bother, dear. Martha shook her head, leaning towards her man. He kissed her on the forehead, hugging her around the waist. By the way, that's why I came. We got a response from the jewellery brand. They want the full package of services. You're a genius. He praised his most valuable employee. I'm lucky to have you in every way. It's a good thing I threw away your resignation letter. Martha smiled widely, looking at her future husband, whom she loved with all her heart, and, moreover, knew that it was mutual. Over the past year, she had realized something else important. After a while, it might turn out that the streak of life that seemed black was actually an airstrip. Martha really took off and didn't intend to stop for a moment in the huge flow of happiness.'